Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! heard from President Macron that the EU won't be doing the City of London any favours in the Brexit talk, yet more financial headaches perhaps for the next government. And if he is Chancellor in it, Labour's John McDonnell is going to have to find major resources to reverse the private finance revolution, which, after Carillion, now seems to be unravelling. He joins me now. First of all, what did you make of President Macron? Oh, it was an impressive interview, wasn't it? I, th I thought you interviewed him extremely well, can I just say? I'll flatter you, but I thought that was very impressive. He's very straightforward in his views. Very eloquent, and, uh, isn't very it? Very eloquent, but also, you know, he set the parameters of the debate, didn't he? Now, he regards himself as a man of the left. Yeah. Do you regard him as a man of the left? I think he is centre-left, yeah, on some of the policies he's advocating. Some of them I disagree with. I think mm. he's, it, it veers too much towards uh, dominance of the market within the economy itself. But it's interesting, some of the reforms he's advocating is also about the protection of the well, low earners as well. I, like, I agreed with his analysis about the referendum, by the way, about how neoliberalism has alienated people. As a result of that, they voted in a particular way in the referendum. Well, that's really interesting because he was very specific. He said that um, neoliberalism or too much liberalism, too many free markets yeah. without the protections, was the responsibility and the fault of previous Labour British governments. Well, I think previous governments, but also governments across Europe as well. This almost adherence to neoliberalism, market domination, we're now seeing the consequences of, you, you know, we're going to talk mm. about Carilli, and it's one Absolutely. example of it. But I think he hit the nail on the head about how that alienated people and also they saw no, they were not getting the benefits about how the economy was developing. And as a result of that, in the referendum, they rejected, well, the establishment. But he was also very, very clear that the British cannot get a passporting yeah. deal from the City of London. Now, you have said you're in, in yeah. the past that any deal over Brexit without passporting rights for financial services would be unacceptable. I'm really worried that if we don't get the passporting rights, it will impact upon our financial sector, but also about our services sector overall. So that's something we've got to negotiate. He said that they would be setting the Barnier mandate in March. We'll see what that mandate is. But yes, it's a... It's a worrying instance that he's, he's been cited there. It Very is. worrying, because yeah. not only would it mean uh, m less taxes for a Labour government, It'd but it would hit jobs. a big part of the British economy. What would be the consequence? If you became Chancellor of the Exchequer after Brexit had been negotiated and the city had not got passporting rights, what would that mean for you? Well, it would cost jobs and it would start undermining our financial sector. That's why, though, I actually think there is a deal to be had, because it isn't just the City of London, the financial sector in London benefiting our own country, mm -hmm. It benefits Europe as a, as a whole because it brings together the opportunities of investors joining together and investing in Europe as Absolutely. well as Britain. So I think there is a deal to be had and I understand why President Macron has been fairly hard-nosed about it at this stage, but in the negotiations I think we'll see a softening because there'll be an increasing recognition of the joint benefits that we get from the past. Is he bluffing, do you think? I don't think he's bluffing. I think he's setting out certain mm. parameters that he'll want to, but I don't think he'll necessarily dominate in the discussions about the mandate, but, but we'll see. But if you were negotiating, yeah. if you were in charge of the negotiations, you would not accept any deal that didn't have passporting in it or something like that. I, I set that out as a red line. I said what we should do. I, haven't, I said passporting or the equivalent, basically. Yeah. And I think that's a deal to be had. I don't believe that our current government can secure that deal, but I think we could in government. And in those circumstances, to get that kind of deal, would you, uh, like Keir Starmer and Diane Abbott, be prepared for Britain to pay money in? Well... It's interesting because I, we've already said that there are certain institutions like you know, Euratom, things like that, where we're going to have to pay our way because we need to cover their costs and get services in return. I'm not sure what President Macron means by saying we have to pay to get access on services. Because you have said in the past also that you would not pay not, purely for financial well, services not, to get access. I don't, but I don't understand why we'd have to pay. Does that mean, therefore, we would have to charge them for access to our market as well? It mm. seems to be, I think it seems to be a negotiating point rather than reality. He brought up again and again the so-called four freedoms yeah. and the single market. Can I ask you about something that puzzles a lot of people? Yeah. Jeremy Corbyn has said repeatedly that you cannot be a member of the single market once you've left the EU. 
What is Norway in, the, in those Yes, but Norway has access to the single market, but it's not a full member in the sense it's a decision maker. It's a rule taker rather than a rule maker. That's what Jeremy means. So, so when people say, um, can, we have act, can we be a member of the single market? We could be a member of the single market so long as we agreed that we weren't going to be making the well, rules. You can have access to the single market. But so you could be effectively members no, of the no, single you'll be market. No, you'll have access, but you will not be a decision maker when it comes to the rules, and that's quite important. Uh, because Owen Smith, who is one of your shadow cabinet ministers, uh, is, totally disagrees with this. He says he finds these comments slightly puzzling because it's clearly possible for us to be outside the EU and inside the single market, as is Norway and other countries. Is he wrong but about that? It means access to the single market. That's what he means. But the distinguishing factor is that you will not be a decision maker. You will be not a party okay. to making decisions. So to that extent, it's a semantic difference and an obvious one. In well, sense. it is quite important because there is a distinction between having access and then being a member where you are determining the rules in the future. So, so that is quite significant. So in, in, in the circumstance of you being able to negotiate this, would you like us to be, in effect, part of the single market, would, not, not, not right. rule makers, we've le we, we're leaving the yeah. EU, but you know, really, really close, accepting the four okay. freedoms, paying in and so what, forth. What we've been saying is, is that we would like the benefits of the single market. But that, we have to give something back for Well, that. it does, and that's subject to negotiation. On the four freedoms, you know that immigration was an issue in the referendum campaign. And I think there's a way in which we can negotiate around that, which would be acceptable to our European partners as well. So you see reform of the single market itself. So it would not be the same single market, but would be access to a single market. That would involve meaning a certain amount of free movement, it would involve meaning paying in, and it would involve well, certainly copying a lot of their directives. All these issues are subject to negotiation, but on freedom of movement, we've always said we wanted reform anyway because we do not accept the exploitative employment practices that have taken place in the past and forced down wages, etc. We want protections, but it's interesting, yeah. so do other European countries as well. In, ter in terms of decision making, of course we want to be parties to some of the decision making, but that's about equivalence rules as well. Jeremy Corbyn has said that the Carillion collapse marks a watershed in our politics and raises the whole PFI issue. And in many ways, a lot of people will agree with him about that. However, the people who turbocharged the private finance initiative, again, were Labour governments. 75% of those yeah. contracts were signed under Gordon Brown. Let's, let's be clear about this. It started with John Major. You're right. New, new Labour really took it up. And then over the last seven years, it's continued on as well. One of my team dug out for me some of the st speeches I made as far back as 1998 in Parliament and mm. the articles I wrote. I opposed private finance initiative. Why? I said then, and this is not me being boastful, I'm just telling you what happened. I okay. said then, it is cheaper for us to use the state to borrow funds to fund our public services yes. rather than go out to the private sector. In addition to that, we'll have control mm. and ownership of the asset. I think PFI was wrong, and I said so from the beginning. The people who were promoting it, of course, said, yes, that, you know, there may be problems with it, but this is the only way, here and now, yeah. we can get the new schools and the new hospitals. It and that, been... in a sense, is fair enough. Up, but it? it is. I can understand what the argument was, but it was wrong. It would have been cheaper to... Look, okay. I'll give you the example. Well, look, let me give you an example, okay. if I may, because you had a hospital in Hillingdon, in yeah. your constituency, and you said then at the time that we've got a proposal for a PFI scheme for Hillingdon Hospital. I am not supportive of PFI schemes, you said, but if this is the way to secure the money, it was the only, fair enough. It was the only show in town. That was the point I made time and time again in debates. You are forcing people into PFIs when they don't want them because you're asking them, because it's the only show in yeah. town, if they don't go down the PFI route, the patients will suffer. It was terrible so, decision But this making. is the absolute dilemma. You are against PFI in principle, but yeah. when you get a hospital in your own constituency, you're in favour of because it. The, no, everybody that, felt be, the same way. No, uh, it was because we were forced into it, and yeah. I had the school in the same position. We were forced into it, and all the way along I said, this is wrong, it will not work, it will cost more. And now you want to take those contracts back home, you said to the Conservative Party, back in-house. Now, do you accept <coughs> that involves a, 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 a quite a large upfront payment? Well, we've already got the upfront payment. The National well, Audit Office report, if I just explain, sure. Andrew, the National Audit Office report this week said we're now committed to £200 billion worth of expenditure over the next 20 to 25 mm -hmm. years. So that money's already there in terms of a, 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 a liability that we've got. What I'm saying is if, if we bring into public ownership the special purpose vehicles, equity in these stakes is 10%, the rest 90% is debt. What we could do then is control then and refinance in a way which we would save money. And in the long run, it will save us money. But the problem that you have got is some pretty savage 
break clauses, penalty clauses, well, written into these contracts. I went onto the Treasury website and they give an example of one of these clauses. They say the contractor and its financiers are fully compensated, open brackets, i.e. no worse off than if the contract had proceeded as expected. And departments across Whitehall are supposed to use those Parliament, contracts to do PFIs. Well, it depends on the individual contract. You take Transport for London, they terminated one PFI, they saved nearly £500 million. Mm. There will be some contracts which have clauses it's like too that expensive in there. To get out of. Well, no, we'll, we'll look at those, but Parliament will determine the price that we pay for the special purpose vehicle, that's the first thing, and mm. Parliament will determine the conditions for the future. I, look, I've warned against these for over 20 years. What I regret I'm not that arguing with this at all. I'm just arguing about the cost of bringing them back I'm in again. And what I'm saying is, is that I, um, the advice I'm mm. saying to people, it will be cheaper now so to bring the special purpose vehicles into public ownership. Parliament will determine the price. We can renegotiate the terms of the debt mm. that there is now and ch make it cheaper. That's what a lot of people do in their own lives. They go out and renegotiate their mortgage to save money, and that's what we'll do under this. Now, another conversation that we have had over the months and years, probably, yeah. is over the cost of renationalisation. Yeah. And yeah. you've never given me a figure anywhere like it. But now, um, one of the, the admittedly right of centre leaning think oh, tanks has kindly, <laughs> kindly moved in it's to help. More than, it's and more than right of centre, it's the, almost the Department of the Conservative but this Party. Is, this is the problem. If you okay, won't give the on. figures, other people will. Okay. Now, let's take the example of water. There are lots and lots of voters, particularly young yeah. voters perhaps, who look at the sky above and look at the, their taps <laughs> and think, why are we paying such a huge amount of money, £86 billion, to a private company to give us water? And they would like water to I be renationalised. Mm. But the cost according to the CPS, would be £86 billion. I know, that's pounds. laughable figures. The Too C high. Let's be clear. Too high? Yes, of course. Look, let's be clear. The CPS is almost like a department of the Conservative Party. That report was written to a former advisor to Am Amber Rudd, so it's hardly independent. And eventually well, somebody me, else would do course, a similar of course, kind of report. Now, what, what I'm saying is, is that Parliament will determine the price okay. that we pay. Let, so let me, so let me 50 billion for water, is that too a, high or too low? I think it is, but Parliament will determine the price. Let me just use this analogy, because mm. I think people need to understand the process of it. It's almost like buying a property. We go out and we buy a house in London. The average price is half a million. We borrow that money from the bank, okay? okay. I then rent that house out. It brings in a rent. So in other words, I've got, I borrowed half a million, but I've got an asset of half a million, so they square it and net each other off. I put it out, I rent it out, that rent comes in, I pay the mortgage, the rent will also cover a, a bit of income for myself, but also it will cover a bit of repair, maybe extend the property. That's what we'll do here. We'll so, bring them in-house. Yes, we'll borrow the money to do that, but the cost of the... Well, basically, okay. the income that comes from those assets will cover that cost and enable okay. us, I think, to reduce price and invest. Socialism is the language of priority, <laughs> somebody <laughs> once said. Um, as Labour Chancellor, you will have lots and lots of call yeah. on money, lots of things on welfare, on yeah. education, yeah. NHS and so forth that you need to find money for. Yeah. Is it really worth it to spend quite so much money to bring the PFI contracts in early and also for national I tell you why. I tell you why. Is we'll, it worth it? Yes, I think it is. I tell you why, because at the moment our NHS, our education services, other services are being drained by the exploitation of these private finance initiatives. Look at the National Audit Office report. It just gives okay. one example of schools, 40% above the cost than if we'd borrowed as a state. Okay. One hospital, 70% above the cost. Some of our health okay. authorities, they're paying out 20% of their income on the basis of PFI schemes. Matt, you're going to change that. There is one other thing I must, must yeah. ask you about this week, and you'll probably know what it is. Andrea Ledson, the leader of the House of Commons, yeah. made a very strong personal I'm attack saying. on you. She said about comments that you made on Esther McVeigh, yeah. this is truly evil, utterly disgusting. The laughter about launching a campaign against Esther McVeigh and then the guff wars about killing her. Seriously, is this Jeremy Corbyn's kind of gender no, politics? No. This has to stop. Now, you've been, as yeah. it were, hounded by this quote for a very long time. I'm surprised at Angela. Well, I, I like her. She's, she's a good woman. Look, let me, you the, know the, what the, happened. Well, the problem is that the audio has now become available know, of that I meeting. Know. Um, and people think that you weren't simply quoting people, as you've always said, you were quoting somebody else, but that you were somehow quoting them approvingly. No, of course I wasn't. And of course I wasn't, but also... But there remember, was laughter. I know, but that, it was a stand-up thing, and I was saying, look, there's how rough politics is up there, it's ridiculous. I'd but like to remember, end it. Yeah, let's end it here, though. Remember, a couple of weeks later in Parliament, I got up and made a statement and said, of course I don't agree with that. I don't wish harm to anybody. Right. And I refuted it completely. 
What happened? What, let me just say that. Shall what, we play the? I mean, you can play the audio. Would, yeah. you, like, would you like me to? No, play I the don't know. You don't need to. I know exactly what was on it. But let me be clear. What happened here? That was recorded by, I think, Daily Mail or something like that. They did nothing until Ed Miliband was getting up to make a major speech, and then they ran the story to spike his speech. It was a political manoeuvre, but I well, made that's it... that's a manoeuvre, but, but I but made it... laughter in yes, the background. Yes, I know, but I, it was, mm. I was saying it was... I think it was a, okay. a Liverpool, Liverpool Public and Comedian, so I said, look how rough politics is up yeah. there. It's ridiculous. But in Parliament, when people misinterpret it, I got up... And I said, of course I don't support this, and I wish harm on nobody. And that can, was accepted. Now, you completely disagree with Hester McVeigh's politics and all yeah. of this, but can you now apologise to her if she was upset, as she would have been by what was said? Well, I said then I did not support what was happening. Of course I didn't support that. And it is for those people who made that statement, if they wish to make that apology. But let me just, let me just say this. I made a statement within Parliament saying, of course I don't support this. I wish harm to nobody. But what I do want people to think about is the policies the government was pursuing against disabled people who suffered so much as a result of those policies. John McDonnell, thanks very much indeed for talking to us.